السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى most gracious most merciful الحمد لله all praise is indeed due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى the owner of absolutely everything in existence والصلاة والسلام على أفضل الخلق أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين we send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his household, his companions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them, bless every one of us and grant us forgiveness. We commence by saying, Allahumma inna ka afuun tuhibbul afwa fa'afu anna. Oh Allah, you are most forgiving, you love to forgive, so forgive us, ya Allah. My brothers and sisters, we have completed the Quran tonight. This will be the last of the series, Save Yourselves. If we look at it, I started last year, we had Save Yourself, part one, and this year we continued Save Yourself, part two. This is the final episode we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from us and to grant us true change in our lives for the right reasons and in the positive and correct direction. I mean, my brothers and sisters, the Quran has in it many types of verses. The three primary types of verses in the Quran Number one, it has in it stories of the past, which means that does not reduce the Quran to a book of astaghfirullah tales, like some people say. We need to word things very carefully. It is a book that has in it the accurate details of what happened before us. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the story of Adam alayhi salam, the stories of the previous prophets, he is mentioning them for a reason for us. We need to learn what happened to them, what may happen to us if we were to follow the wrong path. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions specific details and he omits certain details that perhaps may not be exactly according to his divine knowledge of our relevance. So what is in the Quran? Absolutely important. What has been explained by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Absolutely important. If there is anything beyond that in terms of the stories of the past, we actually do not need that detail. We're not going to be asked about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to ask you on the day of judgment, tell me what happened to Adam, for example, alayhi salatu wa salam. But what is in the Quran? It's our duty. It's the word of Allah. He has revealed it for a reason. All the verses are actually valid. The second type of verses, the verses that have within them the predictions of what is going to happen in the future. So you have, for example, the Day of Judgment, the description of the, the end of times, what will happen, some of the signs, etc. These prophecies, everything mentioned in the Quran, these are a large number of verses in the Quran. And we as mu'mineen and believers believe firmly that this is the absolute truth. It will definitely happen. The third type of verses, which is extremely important, verses that have what is known as hukmu ma baynana. They have rules and regulations regarding our living, that which happens between us, that which happens in our lives. Now, in order to fulfill these rules and regulations, we need to understand them. When Allah speaks about salah, salah is prayer. You cannot choose to do what you want and substantiate it by saying Allah says wa aqimu salata wa atu zakata so i'm going to give one shoe away for example to the man who lives down the road and i'm going to for example perhaps hop on my feet for 10 minutes and then that's my prayer you cannot do that there is a method there is an understanding there are conditions for salah you need to have wudu you need to learn about it from the sunnah of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so the verses are all applicable it's not like it's not applicable but the method of application is where we need to understand. We go back to the sunnah. We understand the context of revelation. We look at what happened and we look at how to apply the rules and regulations. What is farad? Compulsory. What is sunnah? What is nafil? This is explained elsewhere, not necessarily in the Quran. Subhanallah. How many salah they are, where they are meant to be fulfilled, how they are meant to be fulfilled, where are you facing the conditions, the rules and the regulations. The same applies to zakah. And for your information, the same applies to jihad. Fi sabilillah. Many of us speak about jihad. And unfortunately, I have been misquoted. 
and some out of mischief have said that I said that the verses of jihad are irrelevant, inapplicable, it does not matter anymore, etc. These were tales of the past. A'udhu Billah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. That is the furthest from the truth. The reality is the verses are applicable, but the application of those verses governed by strict conditions, rules, regulations, do's and don'ts, where, when, how, etc. If you don't look at it, you cannot just kill those who are around you from among the non-Muslims or those you disagree with or those whom it suits you to call them, for example, kuffar, and you start killing and harming and hitting and taking a verse of the Quran to substantiate your misbehavior and your unacceptable action. And then you say, this is jihad fi sabilillah. It is not at all jihad. That is not what the verses were revealed for. These verses are indeed valid, but let's not be confused. The application of these verses are governed with very strict conditions, rules, regulations, just like salah. There is a time, there is wudu, there is a place you have to face a certain direction. You will start in a certain way, you will do certain things. There has to be all these conditions, rules and regulations met and then your two units of prayer shall be accepted. So the same applies, let's not misconstrue. When there were instructions that were issued to the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they were definitely for the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Like I've always said, the lesson is for every one of us, but how to extract rules and regulations from those verses is not the job of everyone. It is the job of the specialists, those who know, those who are the jurists and the jurisprudence experts. They will look into those verses and they will translate, they will explain, this is how you derive a ruling. This is when it is applicable. This is what was meant by this verse. Here is another verse explaining this verse. And I explained yesterday when I was talking about the Surah Al-Mumtahina and I explained about the relationship of the Muslims with the Kuffar. And I told you that in verse number nine, Allah says that he does not prohibit you from having a relationship with those from among the Kuffar who have not fought you. They have not harmed you. They have not driven you out of your homes. Subhanallah. And he here comes a wise crack taking a verse of the Quran saying all the non-Muslims need to be killed. Astaghfirullah. How did he get that? It's this is what we say when we say be careful. The application of these verses is very, very strictly governed by rules, regulations and conditions. We need to understand them. Islam is definitely a religion of peace. In this masjid, perhaps 10 years back, I had said that Islam is a religion of peace. It stands for peace. It promotes peace. It will mean peace. When you practice it, you will achieve the peace in the dunya and the akhirah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. I felt it important to clarify this because there are so many people out there on social media and elsewhere who put words into your mouth and they make you say things that astaghfirullah you never meant and you never ever said but it suits them and their agenda to do that. Therefore, they try and tarnish, not just you, but the message of the deen. And they try and con the unsuspecting masses into believing that Islam promotes the haphazard killing of anyone you disagree with. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. That is definitely something that I felt in my heart needed clarification. And I'm thankful to Allah for giving me this opportunity to clarify this. My brothers and sisters, we move on to Surah Al-Dahr. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Dahr, many factors, and I'm going to pick up a few points from a few of the surahs that we've read. As you know, we read a lot of surahs. In Surah Al-Dahr, Allah reminds us of the beginning. There was a time before you were born, before your father was born, before you ever existed, when you were not in existence at all. Allah put you into existence in soul form. He blew that soul into a body and then you became known as a person. So Allah says in the opening verse, Showing the insignificance of man. Had a time not passed, during which man was nothing to be mentioned of, not at all. Today, people refer to you and me with our names. There was a time when perhaps, or those who don't know our names, they might say he or she. We, we were at a certain stage neither referred to by our names because we didn't exist, nor he, nor she, nor it, subhanallah. And did you know something very interesting? When you die, you go back to that. Think about it. What's your name? So say your name in your mind, okay? 
and then try and remember a day when you were in the presence of people who had perhaps a deceased person of their family with them. What did they refer to that person as? When they had to carry, say for example, a person whose name was Abdullah. Did they say, brothers, bring Abdullah here? No, they said, bring the body here. You became known as the body. Why? Because your name was no longer relevant. You are gone. It's your body. Your body needs to go into the grave. If you take a careful look at this, it goes to show you that this identity of yours is relevant while you're alive for the dunya. In the akhirah, you will be known by the name, but that is only when you are giving the hisab and thereafter. But between now and then, when you're buried, bring the body here, lower the body. Nobody ever says lower Muhammad or Abdullah into the grave. No one uses your name at that stage. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. Let's save ourselves from the torment of the grave by realizing that we were so insignificant and we will be returned into insignificance except for those who've done good deeds and who believe. So let's believe in the Almighty and in the last day and in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and whatever we are required to believe in and let's try our best by doing the best of deeds and by seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says in verse number 27 of the same surah, surah to dahr is surah number 76 of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna haulai yuhibboon al-ajilah wa yadharoon wara'ahum yawman thaqeela. Speaking about the evil people, the hypocrites, those who follow their whims and fancies. Allah says, those people, they love that which is right here, right now. And they are forgetting about a day behind them, which is going to come. That will be yawman thaqeelan, a very heavy day. Those who commit sin and forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and follow their whims and fancies. Allah says, they are forgetting a very heavy day that's going to come for them. At some stage, it's going to come for them. So from this verse, Allah is reminding us, turn to me, subhanallah. Turn to me. No matter what you've done, seek my forgiveness. That is why I have reminders in the Quran, subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. The same applies in Surah Al-A'la. We hear it so many times, don't we? Sabbihisma rabbika al-A'la. I'm sure we hear it a lot. It's a sunnah to be read sometimes in Salatul Witr, sometimes in Salatul Jumu'ah, etc. It's a sunnah, beautiful surah. In it, there is verse number 16 that makes mention of the same thing. The nature of man is such that he gives preference to this worldly life, not realizing that the akhirah is actually better and everlasting. So don't prefer this worldly life over the life of the hereafter. You can enjoy this life on condition that you do not compromise the enjoyment of the hereafter. Subhanallah, how amazing is Allah. He didn't tell you divorce yourself from this world. He says, live in the world, enjoy it, but with the rules and regulations. Every country has rules. Every place has rules and regulations, subhanallah. Every religion has rules and regulations. The same applies to Islam. We may be stricter, but that is because Allah wants you to be in a better place. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to save ourselves. Amen. The same applies when Allah describes in Surah Abbas, which is the 80th Surah of the Quran, the same day, the last day. Subhanallah. It's amazing how Allah says, on that day, man will be in such a big problem that he will be prepared to give as ransom his own family members. Take my son, take my wife, take my mother, take my brother, but don't punish me. Astaghfirullah. In fact, Allah says, man will run away will run away from his loved ones because he's worried about himself. I don't want to carry the burdens of someone else. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. Verse number 34 to 37, Allah says, On that day, man will run away from his brother, his mother, his father, his wife, and his child. Each person, Allah says, will be worried with his own sha'an, with his own issue, with his own problem, with his own matter. 
May Allah make that day easy for us. My brothers and sisters, I want to inform you of something beautiful. If you keep on asking Allah to make for you easy the day of judgment, he will make it easy for you. So ask him often. If you ask Allah, oh Allah, help me in my grave when I'm all alone, it will just be you and I. Have mercy on me on that day. If you keep asking Allah that, He will have mercy upon you in the grave. Because that dua you make, the supplication, it is registered. When it is registered, you are granted the dua by the will of Allah. It is not gone to waste. So take your time to make a dua. Ask Allah to help you in your grave. Ask Allah to help you in the hereafter. Ask Him constantly to make it easy for you the day you've got to hand in your accounts and to forgive you. I promise you, you will save yourself from the calamity of that day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. Surah Al-Infitar. What a powerful surah. In it, that is surah number 82, verse number 6, Allah says, O oh man, what has deceived you against your own maker that you've turned away from him? Ya ayyuhal insanu ma gharraka bi rabbika al-kareem. O man, what has deceived you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Don't be deceived. It is Allah, the most honored, the most honorable, the most honoring. He is your Lord. Don't be deceived. He made you. You have no option but to worship Him, subhanallah. Allah says, It is He who made you, He created you, He formed you, He gave you the form, and He fashioned you, He gave you your posture. Subhanallah, he gave you your identity. Allah says, and you're turning away from him. Don't turn away from Allah. Go back to Allah. Don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah. No matter what happens, go back to Allah. Worship him. Worship him constantly. Change your life. Seek his forgiveness. This is a beautiful eve of Ramadan. There are people whom Allah frees from hellfire every night of Ramadan, including tonight. May Allah write our names being from among those. So my brothers and sisters, what a powerful reminder. Then we have Surah Al-Mutaffifin. Al-Mutaffifin is Surah number 83 of the Quran. The opening verses remind us of those who cheat in business. Shortchange someone, deceive someone, lie to them, sell them a product, cheating them, whatever else has happened, but we've cheated in business. Do you know what Allah says? Do those people not think that they are going to be resurrected on a huge day and answerable for what they've done? Do they not think before they cheat, before they rob people in business, just because of a dollar, just because of a rand, something material, you've, you've now gained it in the dunya. Allah says, but hang on, there is a heavy, heavy, heavy day that's going to come to you. Don't you think of it? Do those people who cheat not consider the fact that there is a day going to come when they will never get away with what they did? So let's save ourselves. Let's not cheat in business. Be honest, be upright, be straightforward. May Allah help all those in debt to pay their debts. Say Ameen. And may Allah help every one of us in our businesses that we are granted profit that has barakah and blessings in it. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us happy with the profit that we have in a way that we are blessed rather than having so much, but in a way that we've robbed and cheated. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. In the next surah, that I'm going to talk about is a powerful surah we read tonight in, in Taraweeh, Surah Al Duha. This surah has in it comfort to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to all those who perhaps may be saddened for some reason. Sometimes you call out to Allah and you think to yourself that perhaps Allah is upset with me. Sometimes you want Allah in your life so badly and you think maybe Allah is upset with me. So Allah gives comfort in Surah al duha It is a powerful surah to read when you are sad. Read it with its meaning and find out why it is so powerful. Allah says, ma rabbuka wa ma qala. Allah has not forsaken you, nor is he upset with you. Subhanallah. There was a time when revelation had stopped for a while and Muhammad sallallahu was looking forward to it. And he thought for a moment, perhaps Allah might be upset with me. Allah revealed verses. 
No, Allah has not forsaken you, nor is he upset with you. Subhanallah. Allah. Very soon, Allah will give you so much until you become absolutely happy. That's what Allah says. So in this worldly life, Allah might not have given you that. But Allah says, hang on, soon we're going to give you in such quantity that you will be absolutely happy. So don't worry, my brothers, my sisters. Allah will give you. He knows when it is right for you to get what you want. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us happy. So that surah, we should be going through it, inshallah. I'm not going to go through the entire surah, but please take your translated Qur'ans and look into the meanings of it and see what it's all about. It will give you lots of comfort, especially when you're sad. The next surah as well, called Surah Al-Sharh or Alam Nashrah, surah number 94 of the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in that surah, Usri yusran, Usri yusra. Do you know what that actually means? Indeed, with every difficulty, there are two points of ease. With every difficulty, there is ease. And with the same difficulty, there is another point of ease. If you look at the linguistics of this particular surah, so magnificent that Allah is telling us, when you have hardship, search for the ease in your hardship. You will find that ease in your hardship. There will be two consolations for you in every hardship. But you need to search for it. You need to understand what is it. I can tell you one right here, right now. Most hardship that we have in our lives, the first ease is it draws us closer to Allah. Amazing. The first point of ease for the hardship is it draws us closer to Allah. As soon as Allah puts a disaster in your life, what do you do? Your salah falls in place. You make tawbah quickly. You start dressing properly. You cut your sins. You actually come for tahajjud. You're reading salah. What is that? It's a beautiful point of ease. Allah says, well, we love you. That's why we're testing you. Inna Allah idha ahabba abdan ibtalahu. When Allah loves his worshiper, he puts a test in his life more and more. Why? To keep you occupied with worship. Because if Allah blesses you with everything you want, you might forget and you might become lazy. You might become too comfortable. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us from his mercy. Ameen. Then in Surah Tutin, what teeny was Zaytun, we hear the surah often. In it, Allah says, I have created man in the best posture. I have created man in the best possible posture. Now, when Allah says the best, it is a challenge. Challenge for everyone. Try and come up with something better than man. Try and put any organ of mankind in a place where you think it's better for that organ to be. You'll never ever come up with it. So much so that today we have people who've created robots. You know, they're robots. They want the robots to take over from human beings. What did they do? The robot also has two legs, two hands, the head, the face, the side, the videos that they see by, the cameras right here, everything. Why is it postured exactly like man? For what? Because man is the best posture. You cannot come up with anything better than what Allah did. Look at your five fingers. Can you replace anyone in any other place? Imagine the thumb in the center. Astaghfirullah. Look at your eyes. Can you imagine them anywhere else? Your nose. Imagine breathing from the back. Subhanallah. I wonder what would happen in the front here. You probably have a hairstyle. That's what would happen. You cannot imagine anything anywhere else. Your ear, where your eyes are and your eyes on the side. I don't know. I'd be saying salamu alaikum this side and salamu alaikum the other. I can't even imagine this. So Allah promises us. Why does Allah say this? Allah says we created you in such a beautiful posture. Honor the posture. Honor Allah who created that by being a person who is upright. Because Allah says in the very next verse, Besides those who believe and do good deeds, the rest are dropped to a very low level. How can you be given something by Allah? You don't worship Him. You have no idea. You don't worship He who made you. You are not appreciative of such an elegant, respectable posture that Allah gave you. Subhanallah. What type of respect did Allah give you? When people see you, they see the most beautiful part of you, your face, subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. So let's save ourselves by becoming people who honor that duty that we have unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the surah that follows that is surah al-alaq. I just want to speak about the first verse. 
Iqara. Subhanallah. What does it mean? Read, read. Now, that is an instruction given to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And you and I know that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was the most highly educated ever, without a doubt. But he was unlettered. That's why we should not be using the word illiterate, because illiterate is a cheap word. We use the word unlettered in the sense that Allah did not want him to recognize the letters for a purpose because when he brought what he brought no one could say he read it from somewhere else he studied it somewhere he, it was revelation from allah done subhanallah so allah says to him read and and he said that time i can't read and then he says allah told him Iqara bismi rabbik khalaq. read in the name of allah who has created why do i raise this point many of us in life we think certain things are impossible. I teach you something today. Nothing is impossible for Allah. In the name of Allah, everything is possible. It's a matter of time. Allah tells Muhammad وسلم, when he was saying, I can't read or I'm not a reader. Actually, he says, Ma ana biqari, which means I'm not a reader. Allah says, read in the name of Allah. <laughs> everything happened. He became the Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most highly educated. Nothing is impossible for Allah. Save yourselves from thinking bad about Allah by using the name of Allah whenever you want to do things. Bismillah. Have hope in Allah. There is nothing impossible for Allah. He can turn any situation. He can give you that which you wish for and you want. Even if it seems impossible to man, nothing is impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have that faith and have the conviction. We move on to Surah Al-Feel. There is Surah Al-Qadr in the middle which speaks about the night of decree. I've spoken about it already, so I'm not going to go into it. But Surah Al-Feel, why I want to talk about it for a minute is because it is the surah number 105 where Allah makes mention of Abraha who came from Yemen to try and destroy the Kaaba, which was the house of Allah. He came with the elephant and it was virtually impossible to destroy that elephant. But Allah destroyed it with a bird and some little pebbles from that bird. You know, the whole surah, short one, mentions how Allah destroyed that whole elephant and the whole army was gone. Allah says we made them perish in no time. Allah will defend whatever belongs to him. Subhanallah. No matter what, what belongs to Allah will continue. You have a masjid, for example. This masjid is run by funds. People donate. If you decide one day, I don't want to donate. Do not think that the work of Allah is going to stop. The only thing that happened, you jumped off the train. The train carried on. Subhanallah. That's a powerful point. Think about it. Allah kicked you out because he didn't want you in such blessed work. That's why in your heart you said, I'm not going to give. You see, this is why I keep on giving. Have your own cause that you always give for quietly in your own way. Sometimes if people know as a point of encouragement, there's no harm, but keep on giving. Don't ever withdraw from good work, no matter what, because the work of Allah will continue. Allah will protect his deen. And if you want to harm the work of Allah, Allah will destroy you. Look at what Allah did. You want to harm the work of Allah. It's a matter of time before destruction comes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. I move to the last two surahs of the Quran and I want to end with this. Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas. We need to go home tonight and look at the meanings of these two surahs. In it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of verses of protection of mankind from the devil, from the jinn, from the evil human beings, from jealousy, and from the evil that might affect man in the darkness of the night, etc. So we are taught that if you want to be protected from jinn kind, from evil, from the evil eye, from those who intend to plot against you, and so on, you must read the last two surahs of the Quran, Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falak, Qul a'udhu bi rabbin nas, those two surahs, every morning and every evening, thrice. That's the minimum. If you want to read them after every salah, it's a bonus. But if you read them morning and evening, so we read what is known as Ayatul Kursi, thrice, in the morning after Salatul Fajr. And we read these two surahs, you can add on to it Suratul Ikhlas. So what we call the three last surahs, they all start with Qul, right? Thrice in the morning, thrice in the evening, each. 
I promise you, you will place around you a metal armor of protection against the jinn, against the evil eye, against black magic, against people who intend to harm you, against jealousy. And if you don't read these, you are the only one to blame when some of this affects you. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us. The reason I end this way, to save ourselves from the black magic, from the evil eye, from jealousy, from the jinn, and from being harmed in such different ways, we need to read this. So let's save ourselves by taking a moment. Wallahi, it doesn't take more than five to 10 minutes. It does not take more than five to 10 minutes. Invest in those five, 10 minutes every morning and evening after Salatul Fajr, after Salatul Maghrib. Sit and read this. Ayatul Kursi thrice, these three surahs, Al Ikhlas, Falak, and Nas. Read them thrice each. There are a few other very short du'as. If you can learn them, learn them. Bismillah alladhi la yadurru ma'asmihi shay'un fil ard wa la fil samai wa huwa sami'u al-alim. A'udhu bi kalimati Allahi tammati min sharri ma khalaq. Inshallah, we will be protected by Allah and we will save ourselves in the dunya and in the akhirah. My brothers and sisters, we pray for each other that Allah grant us Jannatul Firdaus in the same way He has gathered us here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gather us in the gardens of Jannah. May He save us from Jahannam. May He save us from the evil of this world and the next. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanakallahumma